Um, my name is Katherine Gajewski. I'm the Director of Sustainability for the City of Philadelphia. And I've been very lucky over the course of the last five years or so to work with a number of partners across the city to advance our sustainability goals and also to be able to work nationally with partners to keep the movement going forward and to constantly be thinking about how we innovate within city government and work effectively with the private sector, um, the public sector, the nonprofit sector. So um, I'm very privileged today to have the task of facilitating a conversation over the next half an hour or so between these esteemed panelists to my right. Um, I'm joined by David Crane, who's the CEO of NRG. Scott McNeil, O'Neill, sorry, who's the CEO. I know a Scott McNeil, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> He's the CEO of the 76ers and the former managing director of the Madison Square Garden. Mike Richter, who is the CEO of ECP Capital and a former Rangers goalie and NHL Hall of Famer. I had the opportunity to meet Mike very briefly yesterday and upon learning that he went from being an NHL goalie to a green finance guy, I pledged to never stereotype NHL players ever again. So. I can bring you back down, don't worry about that. And last but not least, uh, Christina weiss Lori, who's the president of the Eagles Youth Partnership for Social Responsibility. And I want to thank uh, Christina in particular for hosting the session yesterday at Lincoln Financial Field. It was really a great day where we dug into sustainability issues in a little bit more detail. And I know that Christina has a national and international profile, but she really is um, a sustainability celebrity here in Philadelphia with all the work she's been doing with the Eagles. So the focus of this session is on how the sports industry has the ability to be at the cutting edge of sustainability issues. Our panelists are each gonna speak to how senior leaders working in sports or businesses servicing the sports industry are pushing the envelope and starting to integrate sustainability in their operations and core mission. We're also gonna spend a little bit of time talking about the future, trends that we're seeing, where this is all going, and how we take it to scale both within the sports industry and beyond into the greater community. Um, and I know that many of you know each other well, so please feel free, interject, go back and forth, disagree with each other, however you wanna do it. We're hoping to keep this very free flowing as a conversation. So I'm gonna start off with um, a broad question that Christina, maybe I'll ask you to take first. Um, I'm kind of curious from each of your perspectives, why is it so important for sports facilities and teams to be so innovative and visible and active when it comes to sustainability? And Christina, maybe you can kick us off by telling us about kind of why and how the Eagles decided to strive for the goal of being the greenest sports team in the country and what that experience has been like for you so far. Thank you. Um, well, I'm not sure I would define it as, you know, a competition amongst others in terms of being the greenest team. I think it was more about a competition against each other at the Eagles to figure out how we could become as environmentally responsible as we possibly could. And um, in 2003, we opened our new stadium, Lincoln Financial Field, and we were horrified by the amount of energy that we consumed and the amount of waste that we generated. And that quickly led us to, fig to try and figure out and come up with a program that, that would reduce our environmental footprint. And um, obviously, as you all know, and you've heard a lot today, um, we're a, sp a professional sports team, and we have a unique platform. And we you know, reach thousands and thousands of people. And through social media, you know, we have millions of eyeballs. And how you know, we go down this sustainability path allows us to you know, raise awareness. And so when we launched Go Green, the Go Green program in 2003, it was with a simple blue recycling container under each employee's desk. But you know, over time, and you know, we consulted with the Sexton company, and through trial and error, this program has grown exponentially and has become all-encompassing. It's, it's about conservation, it's about clean energy, it's about recycling and composting and reforestation and green procurement, and on and on. Um, but the key point about how we reached this point today is, is we couldn't have done it without our partners. And I have um, David Crane here with NRG who's been an amazing, amazing partner. But I'll give you an example. After a game um, a number of years ago, we took a trash container and we dumped all the contents of it um, on a table at, at the back of our stadium and at the 
At the time, we asked our recycling um, the company who we were partners with in recycling, and we said to them, can you look at all the items here and tell us which ones have to go into a landfill? And um, then we turned to Aramark, another one of our partners, you know, our vending partner, and we said, can you help us figure out which, how we can replace this, these items? And so today, I mean, I'm really proud. 99% um, of our trash is diverted from landfills, but it's about partnerships. We could never do this on our own. Yes, we have this unique platform, but it's, it's the wherewithal of everybody that makes us have the success that we have. Same thing with the solar panels at the stadium and the, and the wind turbines. Um, it's through NRG's expertise that we have the capacity to generate 30% of our energy from these clean sources. So at the end of the day, it, you know, it might start with our commitment, but it's all about the innovation and the, and the vision of our partners that enables us to, to get to the point that we have. David, maybe you could tack on there, if you don't mind, and tell us a little bit more about the partnership with the Eagles and what you were able to do at Lincoln Financial Field and kind of what you think the possibilities are at other stadiums. Well, let me just say the journey that brought us there um, about three or four years ago, um, the, the, uh, we were entering the area of you know, clean energy and uh, we did a deal with the Empire State Building that they would buy nothing but renewable energy. And, you know, they had a press conference and, and you know, one day they lit up the top of the Empire State Building green for, you know, one night, and then it was over. And, 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 and I said, you know, we, how do we sort of convey the fact that, or how does the owner of the Empire State Building convey the fact that they're buying only clean energy? Because we can't slap solar panels, you know, on the side of the Empire State Building. So, what are the iconic structures in our society that are more horizontal than vertical? You know, and about the time we were having this discussion internally, the Eagles actually announced a, a breathtaking uh, plan to actually go all green and actually take the stadium completely off grid. Uh, and and as, I, as I think I understood, maybe as Laura, that I mean, you, got, you all got two calls from the President of the United States, I think, within the first week. I mean, and it just showed the amazing uh, pull of like an NFL franchise, like showing leadership, like, and not just incremental leadership, but a, a great leap forward. Now, we're in the electric industry, so the minute we heard about the plan, we actually knew it would never happen. Uh, because, um, because it, it, because, and you know, I'm not gonna bore people by talking about electricity, but because of the unusual load patterns of a football stadium, right. uh, it actually makes no sense to take a football stadium off grid, but, but it was the nobility of the idea <laughs> that got to us. And, Thank you, David. And I have to say, <laughs> uh, yeah. I, I have to say. She was ahead of her time. I, she was way ahead of her time. But I have to say, I would take exception with one thing that Christia said, and I do that with great trepidation, which is one of the things that appeals to us about the NFL, apart from the fact that they have iconic horizontal construction, is it's a brutally competitive world. Sports is a brutally competitive world. And after the Eagles made their announcement, suddenly other teams started calling us. And I'll, I'll never forget my first meeting with John Mara of the New York Giants and talked to him about what we might do up at MetLife Stadium in the Meadowlands. And he ended the conversation by saying to me, David, I'm a football guy. I come from a football family. All I've ever done is football. He goes, I don't, I don't know anything about energy. I think I trust you and all. He goes, I just want to do one thing. I said, what's that, John? He goes, I want to beat the Eagles. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you know, I want to beat them on the field. I want to beat them to getting clean energy on my stadium. And, uh, and so we would actually like to tuck into that competitive environment that sports has. To, and, and, and I actually said to them, as I said to the owner of the Washington Redskins, we're going to put solar on your stadium, and then we're going to go to Philadelphia and do something better there, and then you all have to respond you know, to that. So actually, the, the Eagles have by far the biggest and most complete uh, you know, clean energy uh, um, system within the NFL, and I think of all of sports, at least in North America. And uh, to us, um, what's really important about it is um, Clean energy, because it's largely distributed, is really about community. And for better or for worse, the way American society has evolved is sort of the things that sort of community was built around when I was a kid, churches and things like that, is, has 
less emphasized in big parts uh, of our country. But, but sports, the local sports franchise, and you know, with all due respect to hockey and basketball, I mean, no one can touch the NFL in terms of how, touch it. OK, yeah, yeah uh, but, uh, but I mean, you know, the, the, for the, the, the the premier NFL franchises, you know, the demographics of who they reach within the community, all ages, both genders, you know, you know, you just get everybody. Right. So well, let me actually pick up on that and then maybe put it in Scott's direction. But I think what was so interesting about the Eagles project was that, you know, football, especially the Eagles, I'm from Chicago, so I feel like I can say this with some amount of certainty being um, a Bears person, but the culture around the Eagles is so sacred here and almost untouchable. And you were able to make this huge cultural change at the stadium and that culture stayed intact. It just changed and you've been able to do the outreach around it, but the culture stayed the same, the context changed a little bit. And I'm wondering, Scott, I know that you're new again to Philadelphia and new in your role as the CEO of the 76ers, but you were here back in the 90s, right? Uh -huh. I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit about kind of the change you've seen in Philadelphia coming back here and then also the change that you've seen over those 20 years or so sure. in the sports industry. Sure. So um, I, I had the good fortune of working for uh, Christina and the Eagles in 94. Um, about six months after they bought the team. And at that time, it, it was run like a little bit like a taco stand when you came <laughs> in. That's a nice word. But a, but a, but a very nice taco that was stand. a very yeah. nice word. And, um, and, and I, re I remember specifically, and you know, you, you look back on your life and you look for what the key influences are and how they impact you later on in your life. And, and one of the things that's, that struck me, and, and there was a lot of pressure at that point. Um, you know, they, they paid a, a then record number for the team, which now it was $188 million, which was reported and now, you know, it, it's, it's almost laughable now given the, 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 um, the value of the team now. But at the time, there was a lot of pressure financially, like, let's, let's do it, we got to get after it. It was the end of the rich Cotite era, which was a, was a tough time here in Philadelphia. And, um, and the one thing that, that has stayed with me from my time there was the commitment to making a difference in the community. And, and, um, Sarah uh, started uh, very shortly thereafter. I got to work with her and, and Christina and the team there. And it, it, it's really had like an indelible mark, put an indelible mark on me. And then, then having to gone on and work for the NBA and, uh, and, and David Stern's kind of vision and mission as to how, you know, above all else, that we have this obligation, um, not only responsibility, but an obligation to take this wonderful platform we have and, and drive it to make the world a better place. And you know I'm I'm seven weeks in on my job, um, and running I run the Sixers and I run uh, the the Devils and the Prudential Center up in Newark and we're working on a couple other things too. So it's a it's a fun group and I, and I I, I kind of harken back to those days those early days at the at the Eagles. It was a really small staff and we had this beautifully grand vision which you're seeing playing out over the last decade or so. And and I think to myself as we sit in our meetings now in the Sixers, it's you know. Within the first week, we had set the, the tone and pace for a foundation, and our staff has committed 76 hours of community service per person, and our players have committed 300 hours in the community. And many, much of that will be, you know, we'll have, certainly have um, uh, some focus on sustainability, and, we'll, and, and we do things like the NBA does an incredible project and program around Green Week, which we'll participate in. We do a trees for threes. If you shoot a three, you know, one of our players makes a three-pointer, and we'll plant a tree. We're doing some stuff, and again, it's really early in, in my tenure here, but I, I will say, I mean, you know, the, the Eagles are the, are the gold standard, and, and that's, that's theirs to, to have and to hold, and it's fun for us to sit here. I thought the green uniforms were a little overkill, but, but nonetheless. Um, Do you see the green tie, you know? Yeah. Green tie? I don't know, but We're coachable. David, Not you know? very smart, but coachable. But, you know. Um, the green street signs here, again, overkill. So the Eagles have, have they are in the fabric of this community. But, but on, on, from, from our, um, the impact that, that we can have, we're just beginning, and, and we're going to roll up our sleeves, and we're building a new practice facility um, at the Naval Yard. That'll be LEED certified, of course. So we're, we're being responsible, and we're doing the right things. Um, we're going to do it very differently than, than the Eagles do, of course, and, and do it in a very very Sixers way, and we'll do the same thing in Newark with the Prudential Center and the Devils, but, but it's, it's real. And, and to answer, go back to like the core question is, is, is why sports teams, why does it matter? Um, it's because we can and because people will listen. And, and that goes back to your core obligation and, and who you are and, and what you want to, what mark you want to leave on the world. 
Do you guys think it's resonating with fans? Do you feel like sports and sports teams are really kind of doing what they intended to do by raising the absolutely. level of education and awareness? Yeah, there, I mean, there's obviously outtakes. There's all, obviously always more we, we can be doing, but, but I mean, you think back to when I was a kid and it was either Dan Dan, the soda can man, or the Native American with the kid guy throwing the trash out the window. That was it. How old are you? Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so there, there wasn't much done. And now when you, when you flip on uh, and you're watching an, an Eagles game and, and you see the messaging in, uh, on the back wall, it's pretty powerful. Forget about Philadelphia. It's like an iconic stadium in Philadelphia that can make a difference. But, but you know, man... I wanted just to, one of the things that, you know, when we did this um, agreement with NRG, um, David was just reminding me about that, you know, he, he called Jeff, Jeff Leary up and he said, um, I understand why you want, you know, the solar panels, but I'm not quite sure why you want wind turbines. And Jeffrey said, well, Christina wants them. And, and David said, well, fine, fine. But the reason is, <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> The reason that, yes, they only provide 1% of our, of our clean energy, but they're iconic, they're visible, so visible, and they make a statement. So whether you're driving by the stadium or you're flying over the stadium, you see all these solar panels and you see all the wind turbines. And th that's the statement that we wanted to make with Go Green. And we have millions of eyeballs. See, that's why she's the visionary and I'm just the electric You're guy. You're the implementer guy. Because <laughs> I'm saying to Jeff Lloyd, do you have any idea how much it costs to lift those wind turbines onto the top of that stadium? And, in, and but, but that's right, that's where you can see them. And, uh, it spreads the message and our fans, not just the Eagles fans, but fa sports fans in general, you know, maybe over time understand, you know, what, what, what reducing one's environmental footprint means. You know, we also, I'm, I'm jumping in, so don't, you know, you, you can interrupt. But I, we have these insane fans here, and we would never, w you, at the end of the day, what they really care about is winning. I mean, that's what sports is about, is how you win on the field. But so we decided that we wanted messaging that was humorous and didn't hit fans over their head. So I'm just gonna read just a few examples of the kind of energy and conservation messages that we have around the stadium. Um, Recycle your beer here and your plastics outside. That's in the men's urinals. <laughs> you know. uh, how do you know that? Took a minute. It took a minute, but I think we all got it. <laughs> and after the the Monday night's game, you know, waste the skins, the Cowboys and Giants, but save energy. So that's the kind of messaging that you know we're fond. I, I just want to jump in right now, just from a perspective of, of a player. I was once called an unlikely environmentalist, and you're talking about those iconic um, windmills and the beautiful job you did. We all had this tour of the stadium yesterday. Why does it matter? We all know here that sports is a platform to do any kind of social good. That's what Beyond Sports is about. But I think it's particularly um, interesting in the sustainability realm. And the reason is we don't just have a platform. Sports is about performance. Mm -hmm. And when you're looking at yeah. what was your stadium, it was inefficient and now it's more efficient. That's what waste is, it's inefficiency. The other aspect of it is health. I've never seen an athlete not take care of their body, not worry about what goes in them. Mm -hmm. And you look now, when I first moved to New York, I can remember working out in the summer and they're saying it's a big ozone day, there's a lot of particulate matter, it's not healthy to go for a run. Really? It's not healthy to breathe? Like wh wh when did that become part of our daily mm -hmm. you know, life? And you have these iconic stadiums as, as uh, we were speaking of before, and. They're going to endure. Athletes come and go, even owners come and go, but these are the things that people focus on, and these things should be images of health, of performance, and that's what's starting to happen when eagles start to take over and be more efficient. So I think it's an enormous connection with the, uh, with the athletic world. I also think so this, well this, if, you can, if you can reinforce, or we can reinforce to our fans that it's really incumbent upon each of us, and it's the small little things, mm -hmm. and that's when we talk about the reach and breadth and depth of our fan base, um, I, I think that's the opportunity for us, and I, th I think we'll get there. Oh, I agree. Every little step counts. You know, there, there's one other thing. You know, Mike Richter, for like Hall of Fame goalie that he is, he's a very modest person. And, you know, I, I had the opportunity to work with Mike on a project that unfortunately didn't get built. But one of the biggest issues that we have in the electricity world is that actually no one cares about electricity, you know, even though everyone uses it. And so how do you get a decision made uh, to make a statement about going to clean energy? And this is another way in which the NFL is a great uh, 
group of people to do business with because every team in the NFL is family owned, except for the Green Bay Packers. So, so, and families care about their own legacy and things like that, maybe a little bit more than public corporations do. But we, I was working on, um, and so how do we get top, the top of an organization to care about using clean energy when most electricity is procured through the bottom of the organization? And so we were working on a deal with Mike Richter once to put a, a big solar um, uh, array on a, on a hockey rink up in, at a university in Connecticut. And, and I said to him, I said, well, how did you get that, you know, deal, you know, sort of negotiated so quickly? He said, well, I called the athletic director and said, hey, I'm Mike Richter. <laughs> 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 Do you want to meet with me? And, uh, I'm going to talk about, and, you know, I'm actually going to say I'm Mike Richter. The, uh, <laughs> and the there was just silence on the other end. <laughs> of course, the athletic director at this, at this school is like, yeah, I'll, I'll, talk to, I'll talk to Mike Richter about watching grass grow. I'll talk to Mike Richter about <laughs> and, and so his access, you know, within the sporting world, you know, enabled, a, you know, sort of getting right to the decision maker without having to work up through a system that really, you know, isn't built to care. And so to your health and your other yeah. things, uh, access, I think, is a very important part of what, you know, prominent athletes bring to the world of sustainability. I, I agree. I, th I think to scale. So I, I look at what the, the NBA, the league of the NBA does. And, um, and, and I, I think it's pretty powerful. Like at Green Week, which, which is, is um, obvious, innocuous, and we do some pretty, pretty fun things around the league with recyclable jerseys and, uh, you know, kind of awareness and events and players in the community. But when you have 30 teams doing that around the country and the, the amount of publicity and events and folks you can touch collectively, I think is really powerful. And so, so as we look at that kind of league to league, see there's probably an opportunity to do that you know, kind of team to team here in this market as well. You know, when um, I started my job kind of trying to head up the sustainability program within city government, there were a handful of cities that had sustainability directors and programs, and there was this question around whether sustainability was just a fad. And five years later, you know, seeing the Eagle Stadium and the solar panels and the turbines, for me that was a validation that this is not a fad. This is starting to really permeate most industries, and it's beginning to make its way towards becoming the norm. Um, I, I like to think of kind of this is wave one leading into a very clear wave two, which will inevitably kind of just start to integrate this into everything that we do. Um, and whether, I'm just kind of curious where you all see this going. What's the future? What are the things that you're thinking about that you see coming down as kind of where we're going to be in our conversation next year at this summit and the year after? Or those huge opportunities that you think are looming that you want to draw attention to? Well, let me just say, though, what we're talking about, and David brings up a very good point, is, you know, you walk in this room and turn on the lights, you don't think twice. They go on. You don't know what, you just know the lights are on when you, when you ask them to be on. And you don't know what the quality of that energy is coming from. Is it coming from a coal plant? Is it coming from nuke? Is it coming from solar panels that you just put up? And what we're talking about is something that largely works and is invisible and why would we be bothering with this, okay? When you talk to facilities owners, they're like, hey, that sounds great, but don't screw up. I just know that my compressor works right now. Do not mess with it. But there's a better way of doing it. And what we're starting to do, the NHL has all 30 teams taking the metrics on, on how much they're using, what are they recycling, what are their tipping fees. We're starting a conversation right now because of people that are up on this stage saying this is important stuff and we can do better. Just like we're doing in many other places and beyond sport. But in the sustainability realm, you're trying to get what is pretty much invisible and not spoken of, but not particularly working well. It can be working better, and we're getting it more efficient and, and, and far more uh, performance out of it. So I think that's a tough conversation, but sports can bring that to light. Right, right. A kid walking out to your stadium suddenly has a totally different conversation. But I also think that just in terms of you know, the individuals <coughs> or the fans, I think this makes a lot of sense from a business sense, sure. from a business point of view. I mean, yes, you know, we are a football team, but we are a business. And a lot of the choices and the programs we've developed under Go Green make great business sense. You know, you talked about the, the tour of the stadium yesterday. You know, in the last six years, we've been able to reduce our energy consumption by 50%. Well, that's a huge number for our bottom line, and it's a great benefit for the environment. So as those kinds of stories get told more and more, I think businesses um, are, are coming, you know, are understanding that there's, that's the future. And um, as resources become, you know, 
more, you know, water is definitely going to become something that is, that we're all going to have to worry about and Peak figure out now. and, and think of. And so it's just part of, you know, the way we're going to be moving forward. Tough to have these up here on a sustainability panel. I um, asked whether, you know, <laughs> Lowe's <laughs> recycles. Just tap water. <laughs> and and thank, thankfully yeah. they do. What, what, I, what I would say in answer to your question is, um, you know, it's interesting, uh, you know, there are a lot of young people here, but, you know, really the sustainability movement began in the 1970s, actually as a response to the oil crisis of the 1970s, yeah. but it manifested itself in a, in a renewed uh, an emphasis on recycling. And the reason it f focused on recycling was it was a given at that time that things like where your electricity came from or what type of car you drove were beyond your control. Mm -hmm. You were going to drive a car with an internal combustion engine and you were going to get the electricity that was forced upon you from the local utility without you having any control over what the origin of that electricity was. And so the only way people could do their part was through recycling. And recycling is a great thing, and everyone should recycle all the time. But if people just recycle and then pat themselves on the back and say, I'm sustainable, you know, I, I'm just a believer that all sustainable issues are not equal. And right now, we're faced by global warming, with, which is an issue that transcends everything else. Uh, and so, you know, maybe it's just like I'm in the energy world, but, you know, 40% of greenhouse gases in America come from power plants. And so, you know, I would say, look, everything that you do is sustainable is good, but we've got to solve the clean, we have to focus on clean energy. And to Christina's point, the crisis that's coming next because of climate change is water. So, and, and since power plants use 37% of the fresh water in the United States, those two issues are inextricably linked. And so I would say like, Let's do everything sustainable we, we can, but everyone should really focus their energies on clean energy and fresh water. Yeah. Well, I think I that adds, uh, oh, go on. No, I, I totally agree with you. <laughs> I like the applause for water conservation. That's great. You were going to say? No, I was just agreeing with David. I mean, we, we really have, those are the two areas that we all need to be focusing on. And Philadelphia, I think, is, with all the sports facilities being in the same area in, in South Philadelphia, I think we have an opportunity to, to move the dialogue forward in terms of water conservation, Scott. Everyone's looking I at you, Scott. I'm in. I'm in. <laughs> One more sip. <laughs> you're in your seven weeks in the job. Seven weeks. <laughs> like, well, and I think that, that idea of kind of issues ebbing and flowing and being in the front of mind for Americans and then kind of leaving when they can no longer be something we need to be concerned about has been the history of the environmental movement for a long time. And what we're seeing now is kind of this fundamental transformation where we really are faced with resource constraints in the long term that are becoming clear. And it's forcing everyone to get creative and to start thinking about the things we do a little bit differently and to try to put it as a visible issue in front of Americans again. And I think that's why it's so important that the sports industry and sports teams have started to kind of show such leadership in this area because no matter what, Americans are still going to pay attention to sports. So if they can watch the game and start to kind of be reminded that this is something they're thinking about, um, it's a great kind of entryway to get the conversation going at scale across all 50 states and so many different markets that you guys are all playing in and broadcasting in. So I just want to thank the panel. If there are any closing remarks, I think we've got another minute or two. Anything you want to get to before we let all these kind people off to lunch? Well, I think one thing we didn't talk about is the social justice of any kind of environmental issue, right? So you're talking about global warming or water, and the people that are downstream from a polluted river don't get the chance to use it, right? Water's being taken out all across North mm -hmm. America. Um, if I have a sports facility or a factory and I'm externalizing my pollution, you're eating it and I'm making a profit. And I think the one thing that we all love about sports is the, is the democratization of it, right? Doesn't matter whether you're black, white, green, boy or girl, if you can play, you can play. That's what happens on the field. But it doesn't happen. Uh, you saw Sandy that hit uh, th this part of the country uh, a year ago. Different areas came back online at different times. Um, we, we have a real problem with uh, 
uh, energy deserts, water deserts, we have a problem with the socioeconomics of it. And so it's not a level playing field. Who gets hurt most from a lot of these environmental issues are the poor. And so I think there's a whole new aspect of that, that when you start to level the playing field and do clean up your facilities, it's, it's helping on a social justice level too, as much as just the environmental. Great, with that, thank you very much to our panel. Thank you.